بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So I read something very very interesting in the newspaper today and this is the story of a girl who's on her way to the hospital and when she gets to the hospital she has to pay for her parking ticket but she's going through her purse she has no money she's going through her um, you know cards her visas mastercards she doesn't have any credit cards and she's stuck at the hospital with you know no way to pay for her ticket but her dad is in like a critical condition so she's waiting by the the part the payment area and she's hoping that someone will just come by and be like you know here's some money so that you can pay for your ticket and one guy came, he too was in a hurry to leave the hospital and he ended up giving her some money so that she could purchase her ticket. She didn't get a chance to say thank you because by the time she took the money and put, got the ticket, he had run off already. So what she did was she put uh, you know, a, a piece in the classified section where she said to the individual that uh, gave me 20 pence, this is in English, and that's all she took from the guy, subhanAllah, to the individual that gave me 20 pence to purchase the ticket in the hospital, I would, I would like to say, you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart because of, you know, you giving me that 20 pence, I was able to purchase the parking ticket and I was able to go and see my father one last time before he died because he died on that afternoon. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, you know, when that guy gave that 20 pence, he's like, what's the big deal? You know, here's 20 pence, I have to go, I have to get out of here. But at, for that girl, it was like a, a life-changing moment that she got to see her father for the last time while he was alive. And it was because of that one man that did the small kind act of kindness, which was insignificant in the vast majority of our eyes. You know, giving 20 cents to someone, is it really that big of a deal? But it meant the world to that girl. And I think it fits in perfectly with our, our topic of discussion for today, which is brotherhood, right? We are still on hadith number 35. And in this section of the hadith that we'll be beginning today, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانَا الْمُسْلِمُ أَخَ الْمُسْلِمْ لَا يَظْلِمُهُ وَلَا يَخْذُلُهُ وَلَا يَكْذِبُهُ وَلَا يَحْكُرُهُ أَتَّقْوَى هَا هُنَا وَيُشِيرُ إِلَى صَدْرِهِ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتٍ بِحَسَبِ إِمْرِئٍ مِنَ الشَّرِعِ أَنْ يَحْكِرَ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمْ كُلَّ الْمُسْلِمِ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِ حَرَامِ دَمُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعِرْضُهُ so here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, and be servants of Allah, brethren. A Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. He does not wrong him. He does not fail him when he needs him. He does not lie to him and he does not show contempt for him. Piety is here and he pointed to his chest three times. It is enough of evil for a person to hold his brother Muslim in contempt. All of a Muslim is inviolable to another, uh, to another Muslim. His blood, his wealth and his honor. This hadith was recorded by Muslim. So we covered the first part of the hadith already and we're going to continue with the second part of the hadith tonight. So starting off with, uh, and be O servants of Allah, brethren. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in this uh, statement over here, he's saying that all of the servants of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are brothers. All of the servants of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are brothers and sisters. And what makes us brothers and sisters isn't our ethnicity, isn't our lineage, isn't the color of our skin or our language or our culture or our preferences, but it is the fact that united we are the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a command from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he tells us be brothers, this is something that is understood as an obligation. So just like we would treat our physical blood brothers, that is the way we are meant to treat our fellow Muslims as well. This is also a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Now, if you look at this phrase, this phrase in the Arabic language, إِنَّمَا is only used in cases of exclusivity. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً that the believers are brothers, but he said the believers are nothing but brothers, right? So they're exclusively brothers. So this is to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded this, that the believers are to be treated and to treat one another as a brother. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he repeats this again. He says, a Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. The Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. Now why would the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeat this twice? Who's going to tell me this? The first time he says, and be, O believers, brethren. And the second time he says, a Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. This change in words, what benefit can we derive from it? Who can tell me? Ayub, I'm looking at you right away, bro. Nothing tonight? 
What can we get from it? Go ahead. Well, A, there's emphasis, but B, the first sentence is almost a suggestion to do something, whereas the second one is, but this is the way it is. Hmm. Not really. Fantastic. Okay, so let me try to interpret what you're saying. And I believe it's, if, uh, it's, if this is how am I interpreting correctly, then inshallah that is the correct interpretation. So the first one is a command from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا That, you know, O slaves of Allah, be brothers. So this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, sorry, from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is to indicate that, you know, there's a minimal requirement of brotherhood and that is what you need to fulfill. That is what you need to fulfill. Because when an obligation is given, then you need to fulfill, you need to make sure you're fulfilling the minimal requirement of that uh, obligation. And then in the second statement, it's more of a factual statement, right? The Muslim is the brother of another Muslim. So this is the reality of the situation in the sense that whether you like it or not, anyone that submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your brother in faith, is your brother and sister in faith. So that's how we interpret it and that's what you know, the, the emphasis is actually for. Ayub, go ahead. Yeah. Do they really? <laughs> no, I, I understand what you're saying. So if we're treating this as a factual statement, then the second one, you know, how do we understand those statements? So now, that's a very good question. We're going to be coming up to that, inshallah. We're going to be coming up to that. But that is the interpretation that, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, whatever disagreements you have, anyone that submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is your brother or sister in Islam. He is your brother or sister in Islam. Now the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he goes on to give a description as to what you shouldn't do to your brothers, what you shouldn't do to your brothers. And here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa when he gives this as a factual statement, the understood syntax of that statement is the true Muslim would not oppress him, the true Muslim would not fail him, right? So he's giving us these factual statements so that we can strive to be at that level. It's not to show that, you know, if you do any of these actions, you're outside the fold of Islam or you're no longer brothers in faith. So the first thing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions uh, is that he does not wrong him. He does not do dhulm towards him. And when we covered hadith number 25, we talked about, sorry, hadith number 24, we talked about dhulm in detail. But we want to look at the overall you know, reason behind these prohibitions or the reason behind why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioning these things. So if you tie it in with the first part of the hadith, the first part of the hadith, it talks about things that destroy a community. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is just continuing on from there. That anyone that does these things, it's as if he's trying to destroy a community, as if he's trying to destroy a brotherhood. Right? And that is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions these things. So the first things he mentions is that he does not do dhulm to him. And we've covered that in detail in previous hadith, so I'm not going to spend time there. But what I do want to move on to is the next one, where he says, لا يخذله. He does not fail him when he needs him. He does not fail him when he needs him. This concept of being there in the time of need for your brothers and sisters, I believe is a very, very important one. You know, we live in a time where it is... Um, we're encouraged to be very selfish, we're encouraged to, to look out for ourselves, look out for number one only. But in Islam, that's not the way our, 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 our faith works, right? We always give priority to others over ourselves. And we've seen this in many, many situations when the Sahaba from Mecca moved to Medina, how generous the Sahaba in Medina were towards the Sahaba in Mecca. We've seen this in other situations where, you know, in simple things as drinking water, it's a situation of life and death. Even in situations of death, you know, Ikrimah bin Abi Jahl preferred his own brother, uh, gave him water to drink, and even though he ended up dying in that situation. So there's always this concept of preferring others over ourselves. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he put it very perfectly when he said that uh, a person will not have complete faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Now I want to take and discuss various scenarios of this. So number one is having allegiance towards your Muslim brothers and sisters. Having allegiance towards your brothers and sisters. What does this actually mean? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, 
قالوا يا رسول الله هذا ننصره مظلوما فكيف ننصره ظالما قال تأخذه فوق يديه so the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, help your brother, whether he is the one doing wrong or the one being wronged. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told, we know how to help him if he's being wronged, but how do we help him if he is the one doing wrong? He said, you take him by his hand. You take him by his hand. And this is reported by Al-Bukhari. So this concept of allegiance, meaning that we are always there for our brothers and sisters, whether they're doing wrong or whether they are, they're the ones that are being wronged too. So obviously someone that needs your help, you're obviously there to help him. But the second part, that you're there to help him even when he's doing wrong, this is a very important part. Because a lot of the times we'll see our brothers and sisters, they're doing things that are wrong, they're doing things that we know they're not right and they shouldn't be doing, but that is the time that we abandon them. That is the time that we abandon them. Whereas the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us the exact opposite. That it is during that time that you need to grab them by the hand and advise them gently and guide them to the best of your ability to make dua for them and help them to the best uh, that you are able to. And help them to the best that you are able to. So this concept of allegiance, I believe, is very, very important. And this is something that, you know, we, we need to bring back. That the fact that you, there is another Muslim, you need to help him at all times. If you see a Muslim doing something wrong, it is not someone else's responsibility to help them and to guide them and to make dua for them and to wish them well. It is our responsibility, each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Now, when are Muslims actually desperately in need? When are Muslims actually desperately in need? So the first thing all Muslims are in need of are is guidance, right? All Muslims need guidance. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Fatiha, that dua for guidance is in the plural. Even if you're playing, praying by yourself, you will say, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ That, oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. And this is a very important reflection that even when you're praying yourself, why do you make this dua? Because guidance is not something that you want for yourself exclusively, but it is something that you want for a community. It is something that you want for all of mankind. You want everyone to be guided. And when everyone is guided, that is when the world becomes a better place. So that is one element. Everyone is in need of guidance. What else are, is everyone in need of? Everyone is in need of forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives a wonderful incentive to this. You know, I've been working on this project for a long time. Yeah, it never actually got launched. But it's called the Slacker's Guide to Paradise. It's called the Slacker's Guide to Paradise. And these are like all the small, easy, simple things that you can do that have like insane amounts of crazy reward to them, subhanAllah. One of the things that uh, is mentioned over there is this very hadith right here, where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that whoever seeks forgiveness for a believing man or a believing woman, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will write one ajr for every believing man and for every wo believing woman. So when you make the dua for janazah, right, you, you, you'll say, Allahumma gfir lil muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhu wal amwat. That, oh Allah, forgive the believing men and the believing women, those that are alive and those that have passed away. So now you get one reward for each and every single believing man and believing woman. So technically speaking, you just take with the ones that are alive right now, that's like 1. You know, 1 billion right there, right? Now how about all the ones that have passed away? I would say may, maybe a trillion, maybe close to a trillion Muslims have, have lived, Wallahu alam, somewhere around there. Now you get a, a hasan, a good reward for every single one of those, right? And this is an encouragement to constantly seek forgiveness for your believing men and believing women. Now I have some prizes with me today that uh, you know, I want to give away. So I want to ask you this question, who started this sunnah of seeking forgiveness for the believers? Who started this sunnah of seeking forgiveness for the believers? Is the man who urinated in the masjid? No, before him. Is it uh, Go ahead, proof. Uh, yeah. Okay, that is one opinion, so I will accept that. But I need a more obvious answer. Like it's more clear and more explicit. Hint, he was also one of the prophets. Adam alayhi salam? No. <laughs> Go ahead. Ahsant, where? I think it's Surah Ibrahim, but I forgot the ayah. I was the ayah. You don't remember the ayah? It is Ibrahim alayhi salam. You already gave one answer. I need someone else. This is a dua that almost every Pakistani should know. Every Pakistani should know this. <laughs> Go ahead. When he puts the black stone 
I don't know if he made this dua at the black stone, but go ahead. Very close. That's close to that. Go ahead. Fantastic. So I have two of them. Munib, you, uh, sorry, Ayub, you can take one of them. And Munib, you're going to have to share this with the brother in the back somehow. <laughs> he can take it. So you guys can take that after. So we have one left that belongs, that's going to be given out later, inshallah. So this dua of, you know, the sunnah of making dua for the believers, this is actually a sunnah that was established by the prophets. And as you can see, there are clear examples from Nuh alayhi salam and from Ibrahim alayhi salam. The one from Ibrahim alayhi salam is actually much more explicit and much more clear. Uh, however, you know, is the, the point being that it is a sunnah of the prophets that they would seek forgiveness for the believers. So it's a very good habit that should be done. It is a very good habit that should be done. A third thing is that not just forgiveness for the believers in general, but everyone needs dua. Everyone just generally needs dua. And there's a good version of this and a bad version of this. You know, the good version of this is when you make dua for your brother in his absence. And when you make dua for your brother in his absence, this not only does it show that you're thinking about your brother, not only will it increase the love amongst the believers, but the angels, they'll also say ameen and for you as well. This is an authentic hadith from the Prophet Wasallam. He says, whoever makes dua for his brother in his absence, then the angels will say, and for you the same, and for you the same. So when we make dua for ourselves, we should also make dua for the believers. We should make dua for the believers. Now, what are the consequences if we let our brothers and sisters down? What are the consequences if we let our brothers and sisters down? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, No man forsakes a Muslim when his rights are being violated or his honor is being belittled, except that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will forsake him at a place in which he would love to have his help. And no man helps a Muslim at a time when his honor is being littled or his rights are being violated, except that Allah will help him at a place in which he loves to help, uh, he loves to have his help. He loves to have his help. So this shows us that the general, uh, you know, um, conclusion that we're coming to is that in every situation where, the, where a Muslim needs help, it is our responsibility to help that individual. Why? Because if we were to do so, then when we're in a similar situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there to help us. And if we fail our fellow Muslims in that situation, then when we need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be there to help us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be there to help us. And the last point that, I, that I'll mention over here is that another time where a Muslim uh, you know, needs help and he's unable to do anything about it by himself, is when he's being backbitten. So we've all been in gatherings uh, where another Muslim is being backbitten. And at that time, it feels very, very uncomfortable to you know, tell the gathering to, you know, we shouldn't be backbiting. It's very uncomfortable to get up and leave. It's very uncomfortable to even defend your brother. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, whoever defends the flesh of his brother in his absence has a right upon Allah to rescue him from the fire. He has a right upon Allah that he will be rescued from the fire. So this is another thing that, you know, whenever there's an opportunity to defend the honor of your brother, while it may be the difficult thing to do, there's a great amount of reward in this, in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that he has the right upon Allah, that Allah will save him from the fire, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save him from the fire. Then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes on to say, وَلَا يَكْذِبُهُ and this statement can actually uh, be understood in two ways. This statement can actually be understood in two ways. Number one, he does not lie to him. And number two, he does not belie him. He does not belie him. Meaning that when he speaks, you will accept his word. You will accept his word. So in the first statement, he does not lie to him. You know, this is something that has happened to, I would say, almost all of us. That we've all been in a situation where we've been lied to. And we feel betrayed. We feel, you know, as if we, someone has done treachery to us, right? And this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is emphasizing here, that when we constantly lie to one another, even when we think it's insignificant, right? Even when we think it's insignificant, the bonds of brotherhood are being destroyed at that time. The bonds of brotherhood are being destroyed at that time. And one brother does not lie to another brother. In fact, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it very, very clear that there are only three times when a Muslim is allowed to lie. There are only three times when a Muslim is allowed to to lie. The first of them is that when you're trying to reconcile between people, you can tell both parties, you know, such and such was mentioning good things about you and they want to seek your forgiveness. In this form of reconciliation, it is permissible to lie 
to uh, both of those parties to reconcile them. Number two, that between the spouses, right? The spouses is a very sensitive relationship, right? And they both emotionally need support, right? So a, hus uh, a husband, you know, he's looking at himself in the mirror. Actually, that's more of a wife thing. That wouldn't work over here. But let's just, okay, let's keep it simpler. You know, the wife cooks something. It's terrible. It's disgusting. It's foul. You know she's having an off day. The kids are, you know, are, are running havoc in the house. She asks you, how is your food? And you know, you don't want to touch it even if it was like with a pole, right? That's how bad it is. But for the sake of, you know, encouraging her and being nice to her and being kind to her, you know, we are allowed to, to lie in that situation that, you know what, this is really fantastic. Jazakallah khair, I, I really appreciate it. And the fact that you're going to, to stuff your, your stomach with this food, there, while it may be disgusting and foul, there's a large amount of ajar in that. There's a large amount of ajar in that, just to make your spouse happy. Now I'm trying to think, when would a wife lie to her husband? When would she do that? Like when would a man need emotional support from his wife? For a single guy, go ahead. What are you going to say? <laughs> let's go, let's go. This is the moment where a man asks his wife, do you love me? Uh -huh. And she, you know, also in the lake or something. Okay. And then she's like, uh, you know, no. And then Omar said, did you say no? Uh -huh. Did you have a lie? He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this is an answer coming from a single person. <laughs> um, Allahu Alam, I don't know the authenticity of that narration. I don't know the authenticity of that narration. But um, I guess in times of anger, yeah, you know that might work. You're really, really angry at your spouse and you know, your spouse is really, you know, they're trying to seek your forgiveness. And even though at that time you may not particularly love them very much, they ask you, do you love me? Obviously you should say, yes, I love you. Because that's the, the greater uh, spectrum of the relationship. But the point being, in small minute things, even between the husband and wife, for the sake of, you know, um, not retaining the relationship, because that's too serious of a word, but in the sake of keeping the relationship happy, you know, at that given time, it is permissible to lie. Now, can one understand from this that, you know, can you lie at big things? So for example, you know, the wife crashes the husband's car, he comes home and he's like, what happened to my car? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that wouldn't be allowed. That's like a huge thing. This is not what the hadith is talking about. Same thing, you know, you know the husband, he's doing something really haram and the wife asks him about it and she, she's like, is this true? You know, he can't say no at that time, right? So it's not talking about big and grave things. It should not be misunderstood in that sense. But in the small, minute things, then between the husband and wife, that would be permissible. And then the third time, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions when a Muslim has been captured and you know, he's being asked about you know, where the, the Muslim camp is or what the strategy of the Muslim army is at that time, then at that time it is allowed for a Muslim to lie as well. The lessons we learn from all of this is that there's very, very few exceptions where a Muslim is allowed to lie. At all other times, he should tell the truth. At all other times, he should tell the truth. And telling a lie is a huge sin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a huge sin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second interpretation of this is that he does not belie him. Meaning that whenever the Muslim says something, he should be believed. He should be believed. And there's an interesting narration that is uh, reported to Isa alayhi salam. It's an interesting narration reported to, to Isa alayhi salam. Some say this is from the Israeliyat. Some say this is a mursal hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But the lesson from it being, you know, is a, is, a, is a very nice lesson. Where Isa alayhi salam, he said that even if my eyes were to see something with their, with, by myself, and my brother was to say something contrary to it, then I would believe what my brother would have to say. I would believe what my brother would have to say. So we shouldn't put our brothers in situations where we constantly force them to say wallahi and take an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather we should be very believing that whenever they say something, we should accept it. We should accept it. And uh, you know, this is part of our, 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 our brotherhood towards them. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes on to say, he does not show contempt for him. He does not show contempt for him. Contempt over here, what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referring to, he does not belittle him. He does not belittle him. He does not, the Muslim does not make himself look superior and you know, his fellow brother look inferior. And this is something I was reading you know, related to, uh, to leadership recently. Um, how many of you are LinkedIn? How many of you use LinkedIn? Fantastic. This is a nice tip for you guys. There's a, 
uh, a page on LinkedIn or a, a section on LinkedIn called Harvard Business Review. And they review books, books on, on business uh, and, and leadership. And they have some fantastic posts on, you know, a lot of times you want to buy this book and you're like, you know, I don't have the money to buy it, nor do I have the time to read it. And they'll actually like, review the book for you. They'll actually review the book for you. And some of them are actually free that you can get through the LinkedIn page. And I read this very interesting quote on leadership. What is the difference between leadership and management? Leadership and management. And management is that the, the manager will make himself feel important. So you're speaking to someone else and the manager makes himself look important to you. Whereas a leader will make you feel important. As a leader, you, the leader will make you feel important. And this is something that you know, we saw with the Prophet wasallam that the Prophet wasallam would do whatever he could to take the, the, the limelight away from him and you know, give it to someone else. He dressed like a simple person, ate like a simple person, you know, slept like a simple person, behaved like a simple person. And then when it came to dealing with other people, he made them feel like the most important people in the world. He made them feel like the most beloved people in the world. And you know, I still find it amazing that hadith of Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As, uh, if I'm not mistaken, or it might have been his father, Amr ibn al-As, where you know, he asked the Messenger of Allah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, who is the more beloved, most beloved to you? And he says, Aisha. And he says, uh, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not talking about the women, you know, I'm talking about the men. And the Messenger of Allah so goes on to say, you know, her father. And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, okay, that's obvious, you know, outside of the family, who are you referring to? And then one of the narrations that mentions that, you know, he mentioned Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anh, but another narration, he, he just, you know, the Sahabi, he stopped over there and he said, I realized that at that time, my position with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu was not as high as I, I thought that it was. But the point being over here, that feeling of empowerment, that is what one Muslim should do for another Muslim, right? We shouldn't be belittling one another, but we should inspire with one another with faith. So if a Muslim has, you know, like a really stupid business idea, and a lot of our friends, you know, usually do, they're like, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, you know, develop a new form of toothpick or something like that. You know, your natural reaction is that's the stupidest idea in the world. Rather than doing something like that, you want to be like, you know what? I think you have the talent to achieve whatever you want, but you know, maybe you want to think about another idea. So you want to inspire them with faith rather than belittle them, because that's what the Messenger of Allah is saying. As human beings, we have very fragile egos. As strong as our personalities may be, we have very, very fragile egos. So what we need as Muslims is we need to empower one another rather than to you know, extract that power away from them. Then the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he goes on to say, piety is here and he pointed to his chest three times. Piety is here and he pointed to his chest three times. Now something important to realize, the connection between these two statements, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, saying that the believer does not belittle another believer and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, saying that piety is over here, piety is over here. The relationship between these two statements is that a lot of the times when we belittle other people, it will be on a surface level judgment, right? We will look at a surface level of this individual, perhaps his skin color, perhaps the language that he speaks, perhaps the country that he's from, perhaps his lineage, and we'll say like, you know what? This person isn't good enough, or this person, or I am better than this person. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is putting things into perspective for us. And he says that when you want to look at piety, it's not the things that you will look at, that you will think that will make a person good or bad. But piety is over here in the heart. That true piety you will never be able to see. True piety you will never be able to see. Now why will true piety never truly be seen? Who can tell me that? Why is it that we can never see true piety? Why did the Messenger of Allah وسلم, say, A taqwa ha huna, the taqwa is inside of the chests. Who can explain this statement to me? It's the relation between Allah and Fantastic, that the true taqwa is that relationship that is between the slave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That when that slave has the opportunity to do something haram and no one is watching him, it is the taqwa that will prevent him from doing so. And no one else will see that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels. No one will see that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels. So it's very easy to judge a person based upon their you know, physical actions but the true piety will only be seen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now does this apply to someone who says, when it's like time for dhuhr salah and you're like, you know, look, let's go pray. And the person is like, you know, iman is in my heart. You know, I don't have to, to pray. No, that sort of stuff is just foolishness, right? That's not what this hadith is referring to. What this hadith is referring to is that higher level, someone who's clearly doing the obligations, then that higher level of piety is in the hearts alone. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that higher level of piety. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that higher level of piety. 
Now in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he goes back to emphasize that statement again. It is enough of evil for a person to hold his brother Muslim in contempt. So it is enough, sufficient of an evil to belittle another Muslim. Sufficient in what sense? Sufficient in what sense? And this is what, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the scholars, they differed over. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says sufficient, what does sufficient mean? Some of the scholars said it is deficient to destroy his good deeds, sufficient enough to destroy the relationship, sufficient enough for him to be punished by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These were all, you know, valid interpretations. But um, you know, the if you were to summarize all of the discussion, it is sufficient in terms of any amount of evil that you know, if a person thinks. It's not that big of a deal. But he said it is a sufficient amount of evil and to be recognized as evil that you belittle another Muslim. And this is also based upon the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. He says, do not belittle any Muslim for the most insignificant Muslim is great in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the most insignificant Muslim is great in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see this example again, you know, with the companions of the Allah anhum. That Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was a very, very skinny companion. And one day he was uh, climbing a tree or his leg was exposed. And some of the people, they started to make fun of him. You know, that look how skinny he is. He is like, you know, almost, you know, anorexic. And then this obviously hurt Abdullah bin Mas'ud. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard about this, he said that his, his shins will show up on the day of judgment, like the size of Mount Uhud. That he's going to be something great and magnificent on the, on, in the hereafter and the, uh, on the day of judgment. So again, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasizing that point, that we never, you know, belittle uh, anyone. An interesting point over here is that... Um, this concept of belittling people and the rights that are being mentioned, is this only for Muslims or is this for non-Muslims as well? Now here it seems that this hadith is specifically talking about Muslims because the term Muslim is repeated many, many times. Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah, as we mentioned in the previous hadith, he said that any right that a Muslim has will generally apply to a non-Muslim unless it can be proven that it is exclusively to a Muslim. Unless it can be proven that it is exclusively to a Muslim. So when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that none of you will truly believe till you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Like this hadith, it doesn't mention Muslim over here, right? That is exclusively the right to a Muslim. Imam An-Nawi Rahimahullah, he said this type of goodwill is a type of goodwill that should be shown to all of mankind and not just to the believers. Whereas when it can be proved that it's exclusively for the Muslims, then we would say that right is exclusively for the Muslim. That right is exclusively for the Muslim. Now we mentioned this over here, that in this portion of the hadith, Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah, he actually commentated and he said that this act of belittling people, this is something, this is something that applies to non-Muslims as well. That, you know, a lot of people may think that just because they're non-Muslim, we have the right to, to belittle them and to put them down. But it was the opinion of Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah, it is a minority opinion, but he believed that it was not even allowed to belittle the non-Muslim. That even the non-Muslim has the sanctity that should not be violated. He has the sanctity that should not be violated. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes on to say, all of a Muslim is inviolable to another Muslim, his blood, his wealth, and his honor. His blood, his wealth, and his honor. Now these are very similar words to the, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke in Hajjatul Wida, in the farewell pilgrimage. He spoke about the sanctity of the Muslim, that you cannot violate his blood, his, blood, uh, his honor, or his wealth. And here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is repeating it, and we're going to discuss this a little bit. Now the first thing that we need to understand that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi is saying that all of the Muslim is haram. That do not ever think about transgressing a Muslim and any of his rights because this will be a great transgression. This will be a great transgression. Because each Muslim is a component of the a Muslim community and if you hurt one Muslim, it's as if you're hurting the whole community. It's as if you're hurting the whole community. Now let's talk about the concept of blood. The concept of blood. You know, killing another Muslim. I believe this discussion, you know, is very, very important uh, just due to, you know, um, atrocities that are going across the world. You know, Muslims that are killing other Muslims. It's done so easily right now that, you know, people don't even think about the consequences. People don't even think about the consequences. And we have this general, you know, concept that whatever is done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive, right? And I want to show you another side to this equation. I want to show you another side to this equation. So we'll take some several hadith about you know, the, uh, 
the sanctity of Muslim blood, that inshallah will shed some light on this. So number one, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Sibab al-Muslimi fusuq wa kitaluhu kufr. He says that abusing uh, another Muslim is an act of disobedience and fighting him is an act of kufr. Fighting him is an act of kufr. Now, when the scholars discuss the term kufr over here, they said this is not the kufr that will take you outside the fold of Islam, but they said this is an act that you know is very very dangerous is an act that is very very dangerous so here the messenger of allah وسلم, he called the act of fighting another muslim an act of kufr so fighting him is kufr then what about killing another muslim what about killing another muslim and then the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in another hadith he says a believer will continue to move along quickly towards paradise and in a good state as long as he does not spill forbidden blood if he spills forbidden blood, then he becomes slow and heavy footed. He becomes slow and heavy footed. One of the scholars that commented on this hadith, he said, intentional homicide of a believer is a grave sin. So long as a man does not kill a believer, he proceeds quickly in doing good works and remains free from the burden of grave sin. But if he kills a believer unjustly, he is loaded with a heavy burden of a major sin. He is deprived of Allah's help to do good works and reaches near destruction and the hellfire. He reaches near destruction and the hellfire. So here the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is saying, basically there's hope for all of mankind. No matter what sin you may have committed, there's still hope for you as long as you didn't kill a believer. As long as you didn't kill a believer. Because if you've done that, then there's a very heavy burden upon you. There's a very heavy burden upon you. Another hadith, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he says, the perishing of this world is lighter in Allah's sight than the killing of a Muslim man. So if this whole dunya was to be destroyed, then this is easier in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than if a Muslim individual were to be killed. Next hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and whoever kills a believer and he is doing wrong in killing him, Allah will neither accept obligatory deeds or voluntary deeds from him. So here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that whoever intentionally kills another Muslim, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept their deeds, not the voluntary deeds, nor, nor the obligatory deeds. And this is going to lead to a very important discussion that what is the state of the individual that kills another Muslim? What is the state of the individual that kills another Muslim? So this hadith is very important to keep in mind because this is the foundational argument for the other side. And we're going to bring supporting proofs for them as well. Um, in another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, If two Muslims face each other with their swords, the killer and the killed are in the fire. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the narrator of this hadith, he said, I asked, he said, this is the case for the killer, but why is the killed in the hellfire? He said, because he was eager to kill his companion. He was eager to kill his companion. So the fact that he wanted to kill his companion, even though that he wouldn't do it, then that was sufficient for him to go to the hellfire. And then you have the verse in Surah An-Nisa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا That whoever kills a believer intentionally, his recompense is hell. He will abide therein. The wrath and curse of Allah are upon him and a great punishment is prepared for him. A great punishment is prepared for him. Another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, it can be expected that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive every sin except for the sin of a man who intentionally kills a believer or a man who dies as a disbeliever or a man who dies as a disbeliever. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, says, Allah refuses to make for the killer of a believer any form of repentance. Allah refuses to make for the killer any form of repentance. Ibn Abbas عنهما, was asked about a person who murdered a believer and then repented and believed and did good deeds and was then guided. Ibn Abbas said, what repentance is there for him? I heard your Prophet وسلم, say, the killed person will come hanging to the killer with his veins flowing with blood. He will be saying, Lord, ask this person why he killed me. Ask this Lord, well, ask this person why he killed me. And he said, by Allah, Allah revealed this and he did not abrogate it. Allah revealed this and he did not abrogate it. And in the last hadith I'll share with you, if the inhabitants of the heavens and the inhabitants of the earth jointly participated in the blood of a believer, Allah would certainly throw all of them into the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would certainly throw all of them into the fire. So now when you see this other side of the spectrum of how sacred Muslim blood is, there's two things that you know uh, should be you know, happening inside of us right now. Number one is that our brothers and sisters that are dying all over the world, you know, the fact that we see it every day and we hear about it all the time, 
we become desensitized to it. These hadith are a reminder of how great and sacred Muslim blood is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that feeling of desensitization, we need to fight it off. And we need to feel the pain and suffering that they are feeling. And we should make an effort by making dua, by helping the you know, legal charity organizations in whatever way we can to support them. Ta'ala. That's the first sentiment. The second sentiment is that when you look at those uh, ideologies and those groups that have no problem killing Muslims, that just because they have ideological problems uh, with another community, with another sect in Islam or with another you know, understanding of Islam, killing is very easy for them. But here you see in the other picture that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is great. I mean, I want you to understand this last hadith. If the inhabitants of the heavens and the inhabitants of earth jointly participated in killing a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have no problem in throwing all of them into the hellfire. That's how sacred the blood is of the believer. Now this brings us to our fiqh discussion and that is, what are the opinions of the scholars regarding the individual that intentionally kills a Muslim? What are the opinions of the scholars regarding the individual that intentionally kills a Muslim? So number one, we have the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi. Number one is opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi. They said that the final decision is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can either you know, accept their repentance or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can choose to, to punish him. And this is the, the decision based uh, you know, solely up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Opinion number two, this is the opinion of the minority. They said that there is no tawbah for the person that kills a believer. There is no tawbah for the person that kills the believer. Now what does this statement actually mean that there is no tawbah for the believer? This statement does not mean that they're going to be into the hellfire forever and they've become a disbeliever by that. But what this statement actually means is that there's nothing that they can do in this world that would allow them to be forgiven, that would allow them to be forgiven in this world without being punished in the next, without being punished in the next. So that is what this opinion actually states. So it's not that they've become disbelievers or then the hellfire forever, but just that they will get punished in the hellfire for a uh, prolonged period of time. This was an opinion attributed to Ibn Abbas and to Abdullah bin Umar and Abu Huraira radiallahu an. It was also one of the opinions attributed to Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. It was also one of the opinions attributed to Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. Then we get to opinion number three. This is the opinion of the majority. And the majority said that there is tawbah for the individual, that there is tawbah for the individual, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can and will forgive this individual if they are sincere. And this is where I give out the rest of the prizes. You have one bottle of etter left, and you have you know, a wonderful, wonderful gift over here. It may seem like a simple mushaf, but this is an English only translation of the Quran. So this is something wonderful if you want to keep in your bag as you're traveling all the time. You have a non-Muslim friend that you know, wants a copy of the Quran. This is something that you can give them. This is the second gift. So what I want now is what are the proofs of the majority of scholars that said that you know what, there is Tawbah for this individual. What is their proof? If you've already gotten a prize, you can't get a second prize. <laughs> so I'll go with our brother in the back first. Go ahead. Explain that. Explain. Yes. Uh huh. Right, but they're arguing that. I mean, I understand what you're trying to say, but the istidlal is not as strong as it should be. Go ahead. Fantastic. So this is a very simple ayah. The verse in Surah An-Nisa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive that any partners are associated with Him, but He will forgive anything other than that. Right? وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive anything other than that. Would you like the translation or would you like the atar? The atar? Fantastic. This is yours. So we still have the translation left. Now I need another proof. Go ahead, Safir. That, that's too general of a proof. That's too general of a proof. I need something more specific. Najib. He killed a hundred people. In fact, he killed a hundred people. And at the end, that the fact that he was migrating, this was enough that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive him. So this is yours. Now, one may ask, you know, what's the proof of, of that? Where is the believer in this situation? The very last person that he killed was a pious and righteous believer, right? He was just ignorant. So that's the proof from that hadith. And then in fact, there's many other hadith as well. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa 
he mentions that a person has committed sins, you know, as far as the eye can see, that the bataka is placed on one side, the bataka being the statement of la ilaha illallah, and you know, he was uh, forgiven for the sins that he committed. So there's many other evidences as well. I don't have any more prizes to give up, but you can still comment if you want. Question? So questions, I'm almost done. So let me just finish and then we can take questions then inshallah. So as you can see, you know, the sanctity of Muslim blood is great. Now we move on to the issue of wealth. And I believe this one is important as well. That you know, a lot of the times we'll have no problem in cheating other Muslims. When we do business transactions, when we do any other form of transactions, we don't find anything wrong with this. But just as his blood is sacred, then his wealth is just as sacred. His wealth is just as sacred. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, the wealth of a Muslim person is not permissible except by the, the pleasure of his soul. Except by the pleasure of his soul. Meaning that you cannot take you know, any wealth from an individual, except that you have some sort of permission from him and that he's pleased with you taking it, that he's pleased with you taking it. And in fact, in Islam, it's the exact opposite. That our pride is in giving and it is never in taking. And one should feel ashamed, you know, to be in a situation where he has to beg and to, to take from people. And that's in the case where he's begging, that is this something that is disgraceful, then how about in the situation where he is cheating them out of their wealth? He's cheating them out of their wealth. And then the last thing that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions is that his honor, his honor. And this is again something very, very important that we see clear examples of this in the Sharia that in an Islamic country where Sharia is being implemented, if a virgin is falsely accused of losing their chastity, then either the person brings about proof or that person is given 80 lashes. That person is given 80 lashes. And this is to protect the honor of people. That we cannot just step you know, on people's honors and say about them whatever they, they, we like. That can be done in, uh, in most countries today. But rather there's sanctity to people's honors and this should not be done. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives the example that when we backbite one another, it is the equivalent of eating that other person's flesh. And just like we would hate to eat their flesh, then we should hate backbiting them. Because in fact, backbiting is worse than eating their flesh. Backbiting is yeah, worse than eating their flesh. So this is something that should be taken very, very seriously. Now I want to leave you with positive points because I know it's uh, been a very uh, a dark discussion. But uh, you know, there's some beautiful statements about brotherhood. Uh, one of the statements is by Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He says, consider the elderly Muslim like a father. They're young like your children and those in the middle like your brethren. Which of them would you like to harm? Which of them would you like to harm? He says, when you see an elderly Muslim, treat him like your father. When you see the young Muslims, then treat them like your children. And if you find Muslims that are similar to your old age, then treat them like your brothers and sisters. And then which of them would you like to harm? That none of us would ever want to bring harm to our parents, to our own children, or to our own brothers and sisters. And these are our brothers and sisters in faith, and we should not want to harm them. Yahya ibn Mu'adh, he once said, let the believer get one of three things from you. If you do not benefit him, at least do not harm him. And if you do not make him joyful, at least do not make him grief. And if you do not praise him, then at least do not criticize him. Then at least do not criticize him. So he's saying if you cannot help another Muslim, then at least don't bring you know, any pain or suffering to him. And if you cannot make him happy, then at least don't make him sad. And if you can't say anything good about him, then at least don't criticize him. Then at least don't criticize him. So this in summary is you know, a discussion about how we should be treating one another. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. That you know, we live in a times where since we have such easy access to Islamic knowledge through websites, through YouTube, through lectures, and through, through reading, you know, we've made our Islam very, very complicated. That you know, we'll have Muslims that are, are learning such advanced subjects, but they've forgotten the absolute basics. And when you look at the way the Prophet ﷺ brought up the companions, it was the exact opposite. That in fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even legislate the complicated manners till their iman had developed, till their tarbiyah had developed, right? And that is the Islam that we want to bring back. That our journey in Islam should not be a complicated one. But go back to the basics. Focus on your five daily prayers, focus on your zakat, focus on your fasting in Ramadan, then focus on your good manners, focus on giving up sins. And then focus on you know, the, the, uh, the more technical and detailed matters in Islam. And this is what this hadith is teaching us. That if we want to bring back brotherhood, if we want to bring back an ummah, we want to bring back Muslim communities, each one of us has that responsibility. And it starts by each and every one of us treating us like, uh, treating each other like brothers and sisters. So we should take that very seriously. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites us upon true brotherhood and forgives us for our sins and our shortcomings. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.
Our next hadith is about how to attain the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that will be hadith number 36. That will be on Friday night inshallah after Salat al-Isha. Salat al-Isha is at 8 o'clock at Edmonton Trail. So those of you that would like to attend how to attain the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll be discussing that on Friday night bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. We will now open up the floor for questions. Sajad, go ahead. So over here you need to see how difficult your own situation is. If your situation is in, in, is in a situation that you're in like a, a riba based debt and you know you have to pay this riba based debt off and you have another Muslim asking for, for a loan, obviously pay off that riba based debt first because you need to look after yourself in this situation before you can possibly help others. But if you're in the situation where you know things are just tight, like you know you only have like you know hundred dollars left at the end of the month, and you don't know you know will this be enough to survive? Will it not be enough? In fact, if you were to give a little bit of that away to your brother, that's the cause of barakah being increased, and that would be the polite thing to do. Wallahu a'la. Oh yeah, no problem, Shalom. Go ahead. For self defense. Intentionally kills him for self-defense. So as long as it's an intentional killing, then this is a, a grave sin in Islam. However, if it's unintentional, meaning that you know he's attacking you and you know you you just push him back and he fell off a mountain or something like that. <laughs> in, I, I'm being serious, you know. And then in that situation, obviously it's not intentional murder, and the, the sin and the gravity of it is not as great. But as soon as you're intentionally trying to kill someone, then obviously this is a grave sin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can protect yourself and you can bring harm to him to defend yourself, but killing him is a, is a very grave thing. I would say handcuff him, tie him up with a rope, you know, use a, what are those electric, uh, use a, a taser, you know, do something else, don't kill him. Because that's something grave, that's something very, very grave. Wallahu ta'ala Go ahead. Yes. Fantastic. 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 So the, the, the question over here is how do we explain the hadith where the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has refused to accept the repentance of the one that killed another Muslim. And in the other hadith he mentioned that there's two people that will, will taste the hellfire. The one that died upon shirk and the one that killed another believer. Now the way they explain this, it goes back to the difference of opinions that we we're mentioning. So when he said that there's no toba for that individual, it means that there's nothing that they can do in this dunya uh, in terms of being forgiven. And they'll definitely have to be purified in the hell after. They will definitely have to be purified in the hereafter. And he said all the other verses, they're general, and this is specific. And the specific will take precedence over the general. So hanging them or just whatever, killing them would not expiate for it. Exactly. Yeah, they will not expiate for it. Yeah. Go ahead. This has been a, a matter of dispute um, and the dispute over here is the severity of the punishment. So this is still something great with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some, you know, spilling of blood is something that is great with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but it seems that the, the blood uh, or the sorry, the severity and punishment will be greater for killing a believer than it was for a disbeliever and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But there's still something huge in the sight of Allah and it's still a major sin, that's without a shadow of a doubt. But one is a greater major sin. Wallahu ta'ala ana. Okay, I think we'll conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma. You, you have another question? Go ahead. For, for backbiting, yeah. is it considered to if somebody does something in public and mention it? Is it considered backbiting if, if, he, if, if he did something in public but he hates that people mention it? So, but it's no problem. <laughs> so he did something stupid. And, and, and he keeps doing something stupid? Uh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> well, I don't know, I'm just saying in general. Right? So I think it's important to understand the principle over here. And the principle is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked the companions, he asked them, do you know what riba is? He, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, uh, bima yakrah, that is the remembering of your brother with that which he dislikes. So over here, the emphasis is on how that person feels about it. So if a person, you know, there are certain people that, you know, you can make all the fun of that you want and, you know, they handle it like a man. 
you know, mashallah. And then, <laughs> you know, and exactly, I'm speaking with Sajjad. And, you know, over there, you know, there's not going to be any ill feelings because everyone's just having a good time and they're just, they're, they're just fun. But there's other individuals that you know, they're extremely sensitive, that even if you were to look at them the wrong way, and you know, they're, they're like, this guy hates me, and you know, he doesn't, you know, stuff like that. So in that situation, you want to be ultra sensitive. So I say, I would say, if you know this person personally and you know they're going to take offense to it, then it's better not to do it. And if you don't know this person, it's better to remain silent. Only in the case where this person is a close friend and you know that they're not going to mind it, then there's nothing wrong with joking around about them and then that's something that's perfectly fine. Wallahu ta'ala alam. More questions, Allahu Akbar. Go ahead. So is it, okay, I'm back now. Yeah. For example, Ayub. Kind of fine. We have so much closeness that I tell you, you know, in my, in my, uh, you can say whatever you want about me in my private and in the public. Uh -huh. I would not mind ever. Right. Some sort of a pact, you would say. Okay. Is that permissive? No. No. You can't say, tell someone, you know, go back, mighty, back by me as much as you want and curse me as much as you want. Encouraging. But if he says it, something which I won't want anyone, uh, something I don't like, but. I, Generally, if someone else would say it, I would feel offended. But if I you by yourself, no problem with you. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's fine. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ treated the, the companions of Badr. You know, they, they committed, they made small mistakes after Badr. And the Prophet ﷺ said that these small mistakes will not harm them because they, they were a part of Badr. So over here, this close friendship and relationship that you have is something that's exclusive to Ayub or to anyone that it is like. That if he's a close friend, you're not going to mind the, you know, the things that they say about you. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Allahu Akbar. Ayub. Yeah. Or yeah. But like naturally, when you see someone maybe drinking alcohol or this or that, look the Anana. Right. You see someone who can change you, look up to them. Right. You see a cat person, you this or that, down upon them. Right. How should you understand this going with them? I think that it's a fantastic point that you're bringing up. That, you know, you see a Muslim drinking, you can't help but look down upon them. They're like, you know what, I don't drink, so I'm naturally a better Muslim. Or you see, you know, a kafir doing something wrong, and you're like, you know what, you know, I'm Muslim, they're kafir, I'm naturally better. But the reality of this situation is, and even the third point that we mentioned, when you see a believer doing something good, and you're like, you know what, I really look up to this person, they're fantastic. Um, the reality of the situation is, all of this all depends about how they die, right? So us as Muslims, we're looking upon this Muslim who's drinking. What if he ends up dying on the Shahada and we are the ones that end up dying drinking, right? Or that same Muslim that's doing something good. What if he ends up, you know, he's having riya in his actions. He ends up getting punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the deeds that he's doing. Same thing for the disbeliever. What if, you know, that believer dies upon Islam and we're the ones that die upon kufr, right? So at the end of the day, the emphasis is on not to look down on anyone because we don't know what the end result is going to be. That is the, what, what should be important. And that is why you know, we always look for, for, for good endings. That's what's really, really important. And the fact that we can't guarantee good endings for ourselves should be reason enough not to look down upon anyone. Because if their end is better than ours, then they won and we lost, right? And that's why we shouldn't look down on people. That's a fantastic point. Jazakallah khair. Okay, we'll conclude with that. I'll see you guys on Friday night, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk.